Glad you're back with us. It is uh, Thursday draft day on the program. More phone calls coming up. Sporting news, NFL failure to NFL factory. How Nick Saban created football's best assembly line. The author of this, the well-known talk show host, Alec Marvez, and writer. Alec, thank you for the time. Uh, Certainly, uh, Saban, uh, first year at Alabama, they did not have a player taken. That was from the previous administration. Uh, But since then, uh, Nick Saban uh, has owned draft night, has he not? Off and running. Listen, and, and it's quantity and quality, right? I mean, that's the thing about it that's been so remarkable. You know, 44 players uh, under his tenure were on NFL rosters when the offseason workouts programmed earlier this month, and we were talking guys from the Saban regime. Uh, that is as much as any team. Uh, actually, it's less than some teams in the NFL, but when it comes to the ones that he coached, like, for example, the University of Miami has more, but they've had multiple head coaches. Uh, LSU, the same thing. Believe it or not, Miami, 52 players on active rosters uh, in the NFL level uh, at the start of the offseason programs earlier this month. LSU with 49, Florida State and Florida, uh, Florida 46, Florida State 45, USC 44. But when it comes to those players actually coached by someone, it is Nick Saban with the most 22 first round picks. And, you know, you're looking tonight with a, or tonight, tomorrow and Saturday, Paul, with a likelihood of 11. Alabama players being drafted, it would set the school record of 10, or break the school record of 10 set last year. I mean, yeah, Nick Saban's got it going down in Alabama, not only when it comes to winning national championships, but also producing in the NFL. And Alex, I was speaking to a a prominent coach the other night at at an event, and he said, not only does Saban get the five stars, it's the way he evaluates and and, and gets the right players. Uh, I I want to get into that, because the, the, the NFL GMs, they don't care what you were in high school. They care what you are now, right? Yeah, and what they, they have a template. I was talking to Phil Savage about this, the executive director of the Reese's Senior Bowl, and also uh, someone who is you know, a, co- uh, a color analyst on the Crimson Tide Radio Network. And, Paul, he said, look, if you're not of a certain size, a certain speed, uh, you know, and they're not going to go for you, a certain height when it comes to certain positions. They want all of their players to be of a, a certain build, so to speak. And, you know, like, for example, LaMarcus Joyner was a player that, you know, they had interest in but ultimately cooled off on. He played at Florida State. He's done a very good job for that, you know, for them there. And obviously now with the Los Angeles Rams, he's their franchise player. But he was short. You know, he was too small for them to play safety. He's about 5'10", 5'11", and they just didn't want a player of that height at that position. They were looking for something a little bit different. His methods didn't match. And, in fact, Joyner may even be a little bit smaller than that. So, uh, you know, that's the thing about it. Look, you could always have someone that breaks the mold, but in, in, in all likelihood it's going to be someone who's walked on at Alabama. It's like when, what Phil told me. When you see these guys come out of the locker room, look at the position groups warming up. All the offensive linemen look the same. All the defensive linemen have a particular body type. And it makes it easier for recruiting when you know specifically what you're looking for you know it's not like you have guys coming back and saying okay we've offered a five foot nine corner and a six foot two corner no nick knows exactly what it is that he wants to get he tells his recruiting folks his coaches to go get them and then he seals the deal himself when he comes in and, and charms you to sign with his team if he, if he wants you bad enough now, certainly he's done this for a long time uh, he has quite a pedigree being in the nfl under Belichick, uh, as also as a head coach in Miami, as we we both know. But in 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 digging in pretty deep uh, over these last ten years, what else have you discovered? Uh, what reasons to believe or have have geared or led Nick Saban to such success on draft night? Well, I think too that you know, look, they're pro style coaches, right? And when you go to Alabama, and I talk with Anthony Abert about this, the cornerback, I mean, Minka Fitzpatrick, the same thing, the safety, who's probably going to be a top six pick tonight. I mean, look, they know that they're coaching. It's not only Nick, who's who's a you know guy with a pro pedigree, but as you know, Paul, so many of the assistants. And it's interesting this year. Not, I don't. There's not a lot of NFL pedigree on this Alabama staff because some guys have left, but so many of these guys have coached in the league. They know what it is that they're looking for. The, the competition level too. I mean, Paul, it's amazing. You know, guys know, look, if I don't get, if I'm not playing well, there's a, a five-star recruit waiting on the bench to take my job. I, I mean, it really raises the bar for everybody there. So you have those two things that, that work with it. I, I mean, I just think that's an, an incredible thing, and Nick is so hands-on as well. And what he's done, too, is he's built a real structure, right? I mean, the players there, their, their strength program, probably second to none. And, you know, they, they make sure that you're, what you're doing is they give you every tool that you can to graduate, 
try to learn football and to, you know, to be immersed in a strength program that's going to get you ready to play in the league. Does everyone take advantage of it? I can't account for the Reuben Fosters, the Trent Richards of the world's guys who went astray, right? And But that's on them. It wasn't like Nick and the Alabama program didn't give them the tools to have success in the league if they just did things the right way. Instead, neither did, you know, uh, Reuben Foster's facing 11 years in prison for, you know, felony charges of domestic violence, and Trent Richardson can't get a sniff in the NFL. I mean, but these are guys, again, that did that largely to themselves. Alex, uh, if you had to point to one thing uh, in Saban's, leading to Saban's success on, on, on draft night, yeah, I know we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, we've talked about evaluation. We've talked about the program, and it's not just—it's not just his process. It's—it's a—it's an overall strength and conditioning. It's psychological training. It's leadership. What do you think it would be? Oh man, I, you know what? These kids come in physically ready to play. I, I really think that's number one. I mean, you know, you're, you're not going to have to wait. Now, that being said, you know, they've gotten a little bit luckier in recent years. The injury rate is down. Paul, as you know, guys were coming in from Alabama so battered and so bruised. And, you know, I think some of that's, you know, the way that they practice. But let's not forget the Crimson Tide plays what's essentially an NFL schedule as far as number of games often, right? You're looking, you're looking at 14, 15 college games in a season sometimes, depending upon if they get to the FBS and, and how far they advance in it. I mean, it's crazy. So, you know, I think that's one thing right there that, that, you know, really impresses NFL teams. These guys are ready to play. And really a lot of it is from all the different things that you stress. It's like a mini pro program at Alabama. And I really think it's the best one that's been set up because of stability. And listen, with Nick, he doesn't treat everyone equal, Paul, as you know. You know what I mean? It's, it's weird. Sometimes, you know, the kids that are, that are maybe the, the biggest ones that, that may be uh, ready to run astray or have issues off the field, Nick may take more interest in them than others who are doing things right simply because he realizes maybe I can be an influence and help push them in the right direction. So I think that, that has a lot to do with it as well. Beyond, beyond getting beyond Saban as we close up here, Alex, uh, is there another coach, and there are obviously many, many good ones, uh, who at least would be in the same universe with Nick Saban just in terms of, of, of building programs and, and setting the NFL up uh, with his players? Well, I think Jimbo Fisher, you know, I mean, to say the disciple, right? I mean, you look at the success he had at Florida State for so long and hoping to duplicate that at, at Texas A&M. You know, some co- some schools also, they're known for certain positions, the way that it's coached. Notre Dame, for example, under Harry Heastead, uh, you know, they did a real nice job producing offensive linemen. I was talking to Zach Martin about this last night. He doesn't think, you know, the Cowboys guard who played at Notre Dame, he doesn't think, for example, that Quentin Nelson gets beyond number eight with the Chicago Bears now that Harry is coaching there. So, But then you run into this problem. Just because a player goes to a school doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great in the NFL just because they have that pedigree and, and vice versa. Just because a school may have struggled to produce you know, quality players at a certain position, like for so long Penn State running backs were regarded as busts in the NFL because of Blair Thomas and Kajana Carter and, and players like this that came out. But, you know, are you going to blame Saquon Barkley and say, okay, well, we're taking him off our board because other Penn State guys weren't too good? So, I mean, listen, I think, too, that, that there's something to be said for Jim Harbaugh up in Michigan because of the way that he has built his program up there. You know, pro-style coach, pro-style offenses. These things are good, and it's just so difficult sometimes, Paul, for NFL teams. And we see it at the wide receiver position. Look what's gone on the past four or five years. I believe in the past four years we've had 13 receivers taken in the first round, according to Sports Illustrated. One has reached a Pro Bowl. Nine of them have failed to produce at least 40 catches in a season. I mean, guys are really struggling when they come from some, some of these spread systems where they're not learning playbooks, they're not even running real routes, they're just getting open because of the way that the, the play unfolds, uh, you know, just basically through athleticism. So it's been a, a headache for NFL teams. They're having to adjust the way that they do their business. But some of that is uh, you're going to see a trickle-down effect on that tonight as well, where it's going to be Calvin Ridley or DJ Moore. Most likely one of those two is going to be the first receiver taken. But, Paul, we may have the first draft where there isn't a wide receiver taken in round one since 2008 it is a very viable option before you go alex uh, i know there's been a lot of smoke out there today as there always is the morning of draft day often by eight o'clock it changes who will go first to the browns 
I just I got to think it's going to be Sam Darnold or Josh Allen, even with Josh Allen now, and then finding these tweets that were racially insensitive back from when he was in high school, and you know, you know, he, and he's apologizing like crazy for that through his uh, through his agents, who by the way are the same agents of Nick Saban, but that is it's a very small world as you know <laughs> behind the scenes there. Yes, to get fine, fine folks at CAA, but sure. you know, I just I you know I, I mean Baker Mayfield, I guess. You know, but when you if you get Baker Mayfield, what you're going to get is a guy who's going to speak off the cuff, okay? Who's going to, I think, live his life in the way that he wants to live it, rather than maybe you know being a little bit judicious in the way that his appearance are out when it comes to drinking alcohol, things like this. He's already had an alcohol related arrest. You just wonder how he's going to handle the trappings of NFL stardom that are going to come with him immediately. And for my time with, around Baker and, you know, being around him at some various uh, college events uh, this off season, you just get the feeling that, you know, youth is wasted on the young sometimes, that this is someone who thinks that they know everything and doesn't really seem all that willing to listen to outside stuff or do things in the conventional way. Let's not forget, Paul, he's the one that told the Los Angeles Chargers that, you know, no, nah, I didn't really have time to study those plays that you gave me for your playbook. I've got too many other things on my plate. In other words, he's saying, well, you're not probably going to draft me right now so what's the point? Why should I even bother wasting my time looking at your playbook when we meet? On the, on the flip side, you got Saquon Barkley who tells me, you know what, I, I'll meet with any team. you just got to give me four hours to work out when I visit, but I'm going to meet with you, and I'm willing to meet with you, and I want to meet with you. You know why? Because maybe you're the head coach of a team in the future that I'll be at or has interest in acquiring me. You know, he doesn't see it short-sighted. You see what I mean? Like, he knows there's so much movement in this league. Who knows? Maybe his next head coach two years into the NFL is someone that he interviews with during this pre-draft process that doesn't select him. So I just think that it's, you know, Saquon is much more NFL-ready from a maturity standpoint. We'll see what happens with Baker. I hope he has success. He was a lot of fun to watch at Oklahoma. But, again, I, I just... Those bells and whistles, just to me, I, I just again, it's Cleveland, so you know they're known for doing this sort of thing. But we'll see if the John Dorsey regime changes and if they end up with a safer guy in Sam Donald. Josh Allen, a lot of concerns about the accuracy. I think that's where we're at with him. And Josh Rosen, I, I, you know, I don't get the, all the knocks on him except from an injury standpoint. To be quite honest with you, I mean, he was you know suffered had a little bit of a concussion history, and of course, you don't want that in a quarterback. But other than that, if people think he's too smart for the league or it'll be you know someone who's willing to debate outside interests, well, I, I don't see that as a huge negative maybe it's, be, it's being played up in the media that way but i don't know if that's the thing that's going to prevent an nfl team uh you know from drafting it great stuff uh alex marvez many many thanks uh pleasure to visit with you alex for you it's an honor this is an <laughs> sec show i'm an sec guy i'm waiting for my gators to come back give me some good luck here man we need it we need uh, everything right. we can get uh maybe not this year but it's coming alex i promise you Thanks, Paul. Appreciate you, brother. Be great good, stuff. Uh, what, what, a, what a great interview that was. Alex Marvez joining us from the Sporting News. He does a show for Sirius XM as well. We are uh, we finally got a good call. We had to call them, but we got one. Glad to have Andy. I mean, really glad to have Andy Staples on this program. Uh, Andy wasn't sta- uh, scheduled. We called him. We got him out of the dentist chair because we needed him. Uh, Andy joining us from Sports Illustrated. Andy, thank you very much. I was with you the other day, and you were uh, questioning me about a number of subjects. I can't wait to get after you. I figured. I, I knew once the tables got turned, they would be turned back relatively quickly. <laughs> well, I think the questions will be pretty much the same. So you, <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, let's start with Jalen Hurts. Uh, it just seems like this story gets worse by the day, even though nothing is really happening. Maybe we're listening to too much noise, but give us your take on where you see that going. Well, it, it seems like everybody else is kind of coming to where I was two days after the national title game that – they're going to probably have an idea of who the starting quarterback at Alabama is you know, a week or two out from the season opener. And, and if it's not Jalen Hurts, there's a real good chance he's going to transfer. Uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of places he could go. There's, uh, it's, an, it's a unique situation because he hasn't redshirted yet. So, yes, he could graduate after this season and play immediately 2019, or he could sit this season somewhere else and play 2019 and 2020. So if he wants to be an NFL quarterback and wants to develop as a quarterback, well, I think you'd want two years as a starting quarterback. And there will be teams that that will be interested. You know, I don't know exactly who it would be, but if I had to guess, I'd say, uh, you know, Texas, TCU, Baylor, West Virginia, a lot of Big 12 teams would be interested. I think some folks in the Pac-12 would be interested. I think some folks in the ACC would be interested. Uh, The guy is 26-2 and as a starter. He's somebody that, that you'd love to have in your locker room, but I don't think he's going to sit around if, if it's clear to him that he's not going to be Alabama's starting quarterback. And I, I think 
the way Mac Jones played on Saturday in the spring game also kind of, you know, if, if you're Alabama fans, and, and I think Alabama's coaches already knew this. They, they'd seen this in practice already. But if you're a fan who hadn't gotten to see practice, you're going, wait a second, we may have a capable backup even if Jalen Hurts leaves. And in that case, it, it kind of makes it easier on everyone involved, I think. Yeah, and, and you, you hear people joking, Andy, about uh, Jones being the second-best quarterback on the league, uh, on, in the, on the team. I don't know if that's fair or not, but it just seemed like he he had it together more than Jalen did. What's your best guess? What do you hear uh, on what is wrong with Jalen Hurts? I don't think there's anything wrong with Jalen Hurts. He's the same quarterback he's always been. You know, you, you take the non-contact out of that and, and make it where you have to tackle him. He's awfully difficult to deal with. You know, he becomes much more difficult to deal with when you actually have to bring him to the ground. And I think there are 26 teams that, that have lost to him who will tell you that. But, well, maybe 25. I don't know if George is going to say that because they probably more lost to Tua. But, you know, the, he's, he's very talented. The thing is, Tua Tungavailoa may be exceptionally talented. We've seen one half, and I keep telling myself that. It's just one half. But then two seconds later, I tell myself, wait, it was the second half of the national championship game against a super elite defense that he did all this. And you think, okay, you give him a full off season, and, and, and you give him first-team reps and that sort of thing. That's going to be a very formidable offense if he can do the good things he did in that game over. Okay, look, he made mistakes. But he also fixed some of those mistakes or got them out of some of those mistakes with other plays. So uh, I think they'd be just fine if, if two is the starting quarterback. Uh, you, you look at the look at the receiving talent that they have. Just in the freshman class, Devontae Smith caught the touchdown that won in the national title. Henry Ruggs III was really coming on last season. Uh, Hale Hintz, you, you use him uh, in the pass game at tight end. They've got lots of options. And if that's what they want, if they want a more vertical offense, then, then two is probably their guy. And Mac Jones might be the better backup for that. Now, if they want to have a more ground-based read option with a big threat of quarterback run game, well, that's Jalen. But it, it's really up to them what they want to do. And I think if Tua gets healthy and plays anywhere near the way he did in the, in the second half of the national title game at practice, you're going to be seeing to a tongue of Iloa starting for them. Talking to Andy Staples, uh, Andy, not worth a lot of time, but Philip Fulmer came out on a radio show today, and he, he backed uh, Jeremy Pruitt, which you expected him to do, but uh, it's still being talked about, the line about the fans. Uh, what, what is your sense on get, all of that? I don't get this. Maybe, maybe I've been involved in, in – too many Jeremy Pruitt interviews, and I know there haven't been a ton, but but he, you know, he did talk, you know, when he was at Florida State and they were in the BCS title game. He talked to me. He was at Georgia. The man has a very dry sense of humor. I did not take that seriously when he said that. Really? When I I went back and listened to it again, and just inflection and everything else. I thought he was kidding. So, and, and I think part of that was tongue in cheek. And uh, now maybe maybe he was trying to make the comparison to his team, where you know he, he said that some guys were. He later, or, or maybe a little earlier, he was talking about how some guys on the team gave a lot of effort, some guys on the team quit, and you know he's kind of equating the fans who weren't there to the guys who weren't giving enough effort. But I, I think he was saying that tongue in cheek. I don't think that was a "you are terrible fans" because you didn't show up at, at, at this glorified practice. I, I, I think he understands that Tennessee football needs to earn that back, and that the way the program has been uh, the last year or so. It hasn't earned that, so it'll be up to him and those players to earn that spring game attendance this time next year. Talking to Andy Staples, uh, Andy, uh, the Georgia back, the Georgia quarterback situation uh, isn't getting nearly the attention for obvious reason. But what are you hearing from uh, what has now commenced uh, in in Georgia about uh, the situation? You got Fromm, you got Fields. Uh, is there is that going to be a serious race? It, it could be, and, and Kirby Smart has every intention of making it one, and he's fine with that. That doesn't bother him. You know, the fact that Jake Fromm was very upset when he didn't win the job against Jacob Eason last year turned out to be a great thing for Georgia's football program. And so 
if, if this turns into a, a serious competition in August for the starting job, I don't think that's going to bug Kirby Smart at all. I, I think if I had to bet, Jake Fromm was going to would be the starter, and as long as he stays healthy, he would stay the starter. But I would imagine they find a way to get Justin Fields on the field a little bit. You know, people who've been to practice have told me that that Justin Fields is, I mean, his skill set is huge, and he's one of the. It, it's going to be hard to keep him off the field, but. Jake Fromm is also, he's got the respect of his teammates. He took him to the national title game last year. Uh, my guess is he will take the push from Justin Fields in the right way. It will help push him to be better as well. Again, if Justin Fields happens to beat out Jake Fromm, that means he's real good. If Jake Fromm happens to hold off Justin Fields, that's a good thing for Georgia too. I mean, Kirby Smart has made it a point. I remember I talked to him earlier in the spring and he was almost giddy at the thought of these two guys going at it because he loves the idea of a couple of alpha dogs fighting it out for a position. He wants that at every single position. And look, this is a team that has that going on in a lot of positions. And I think it's not a case of, you know, competition because nobody's really separated themselves. It's that they have good options at lots of different positions, and quarterback might be the one where they have the two best options. Finally, uh, the names aren't well known in Baton Rouge, uh, and the outlook isn't very bright. What do you hear coming out of their camp? I'm not giving up on LSU just yet. I know everybody's bagging LSU season already, and I get that it's going to be a tough schedule, but but I'd like to actually see this offense on the field before I, I completely bail on it like everybody else seems to be. Uh, it, it definitely seems like you know they have to figure out what they want in a quarterback where uh, Justin McMillan is kind of the strike a balance between the running and the throwing. Well, all is the is the better runner, Miles Brennan the better pure passer. And I think that what they need to do is, is in camp, and, and they don't have to do this till camp, but evaluate you know how good are the backs, how good is the offensive line. Will will the offensive line and the backs be able to establish a running game? that doesn't require a ton of quarterback run. If that's the case, then Brennan might be your guy. Do you need a little more quarterback run? If that's the case, then it may be McMillan or, or Narcisse is your guy. But this is something they can they can figure out as, as they get closer to the season. Uh, you know, I, I'm not giving up on them yet. I realize they got to open with Miami. They draw Georgia from the east. It's not going to be easy. But I, I have not totally backed LSU yet. Good to hear. Uh, Andy, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Paul. Welcome back. We're glad you're here and uh, plenty of time for you to give us a ring at 855-242-7285. So this is draft day and uh, we all uh, have favorite draft day memories of your favorite player, your favorite team. And uh, Jacob Hester joins us. Uh, he drafted uh, was drafted, I think, t- uh, 10 years ago uh, from LSU. And, uh, of course, always good to catch up. Jacob, what's been going on with you? Oh, man, Paul, has it been 10 years ago? That, that kind of hurts my heart knowing it's been 10 years. <laughs> well, you're still young. It, 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 if it, if it, had it been 30 years ago, you might you might need to be worried. Uh, there you go. You need to tell my wife that. You need to tell my wife that I'm still young. I need to record that. I will. Uh, I'll, no, I'll, I'll notarize it, certify it. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about the, the experiences. And when you know, we watch these guys tonight, and uh, most of the time it's a, it's a great experience. Sometimes it's pretty painful to watch when uh, – when, when you think you're going in the first round and uh, you keep slipping and sliding away, uh, what was it like for you? You know, I, when I was getting drafted, it was anywhere, Paul, from second to fifth round. Like, I really had no clue. Some teams had me at running back. Some teams had me at fullback. And so that first day of the draft, back when I was getting drafted, it was the first and second round was that first day. So I just went golfing, got away from the draft, uh, had my phone on me, but didn't look at the draft. If it rang, it rang. If it didn't, that's great. And then the, uh, the next day, I, I got picked in the third round, but it's funny. So uh, we were setting up a draft party. There was a draft that uh, started at 9 Eastern time. We weren't thinking right. We got the times mixed up. We were in the central time zone. So we're setting up for the party. The, the draft comes on, and I actually get drafted before the draft party started because we messed up the time. <laughs> but it ended up being a good thing because by the time everybody got to the party, Paul, there was no pressure. Already been drafted, got uh, chosen 69th overall by the San Diego Chargers, and we had a great day. Let me uh, ask you about a couple of players, especially Darius Geis. You, you know Darius, and uh, I don't want to act like he has slipped down the chart because uh, he may go higher than we 
anticipate. But a year ago, he looked like a surefire first rounder. Uh, what, what, what has been going on with him? I, we know he's, what he's capable of. Is it injuries? Is it, what is it? You know, I don't know what it is. I'll be honest with you. You keep hearing this off the field stuff, and, it, and it's crazy to me just knowing the young man and uh, him playing video games uh, at nighttime seems to be a, a, an issue for some teams, which just sounds uh, silly to me. And look, I've played with some great running backs. I've been very fortunate. I played with Ladan Thompson. I played with Dan Sproles, No Shot Moreno, Willis McGahee. And if Darius Geis isn't a first round back, then I don't know anything about the position. And I shouldn't have my own sports talk show. I shouldn't be talking about football because he's a first round talent. Uh, he's as good as Leonard Fournette was, those two guys are, are generational backs, and LSU was lucky to have them back-to-back. Both those guys are on the same level for me. And uh, Leonard Fournette's a guy who went top five last year, and I think Darius Geis is that kind of running back. And I think he's still an untapped uh, potential as far as what he can do in the passing game. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I, if he's not a first-rounder again, then I just uh, it boggles my mind. understand. Well, let's, let's move away from the draft and talk about uh, the camp that has just ended in Baton Rouge, uh, you talk about it all the time. We get conflicting stories. Just what happened, and, and where is this program today, and where is it going? Well, look, you, you got the LSU practice. One thing that, that stands out to me, you know, that, that wasn't there last year, is the depth on the offense and defensive line. Uh, the, the, it was way too thin last year, Paul. When you start talking about going into the swamp, playing against Florida, and you have four healthy D linemen, Christian Lockenshaw had to play every snap in that game. And you can look at the Mississippi State game. It was kind of the same situation. And flip to the offensive line in that Florida game. They had five freshmen playing at, at one time because of injuries and things that happened in that Florida game. Uh, that that can't ever happen again because it showed up uh, on the line of scrimmages where you win in the SEC. I think we all can agree on that. And the depth has been fixed there. And so that, that, that was, my opinion, maybe the biggest issue from last year's team that they've had fixed. Now they have holes. At other places this year, yes. But that was probably the one thing they had to get fixed. And now that that has apparently happened, let, let's start with the offense. Uh, new coordinator again. Um, you know him well. Uh, there has been mild controversy over the the end of Canada's run and the Ensminger era. Where, where are you on all that? I, I thought when Ensminger came in as an interim, taking over from Ken Cameron, I, I don't think people just realize how hard that is to call somebody that, somebody else's offense and have the success that, that Steve was able to have. I mean, they were setting records almost every game, and a lot of people like to point to Alabama game where they got shut out, but uh, Alabama shut out a lot of people that year. Uh, I think Ensminger's a great hire. I think him and Coach O have a great relationship, and for whatever reason, that relationship with Matt Canada and Coach Ogeron just didn't work out. They, they did not get along, and uh, I think it showed through a little bit, and now they move on from him, and Ensminger's a guy that's going to change the LSU offense, I think. But when you go out to spring practices and scrimmage and even the spring game, you can see many more wide open sets, and we've heard that for a long time in LSU. But this year, it seems to actually be happening. In in terms of Coach Ogeron, I mean, he's impossible not to like, uh, but you can certainly, uh, being objective, find faults. Uh, give us the the read from on the ground about Coach O. Oh, look, Co- Coach O kind of you know, hasn't changed since, since he's gotten this job. Uh, he's made it known that nobody wants to be the LSU football coach more than him, and uh, last year, you know, with the Matt Cannon and everything that went on, it didn't seem like it was as comfortable as he wanted to be. And you come back this year, they've made a couple of hires. There's new faces all over the place, be it players, be it coaches. And it seems like this is the make or break. Like, this is the people he wanted here. He was going to live or die with these people that, that he brought in. Be it Coach Ensminger, Bill Bush uh, as a safeties coach. Uh, you can go kind of up and down the board. James Craig's an offensive line coach. And he seems like he is comfortable with the staff that he has. And, uh, you know, still the same excited coach that when he got the job and you go in there, it's enthusiasm all day long. We saw the uh, the props coming coming out of Vegas the other day. Uh, I'm sure you talked about it where expectations are pretty low for this LSU team. It's six, seven, eight wins somewhere in there. What what is the view of the fans that you talk to every day and and what 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 do they expect uh, out of this current uh, out of the upcoming LSU football season? Yeah, so when you start talking about six wins in LSU football, that's just uncharted waters. And uh, the schedule's brutal. I mean, there's no hiding from that. You open up with Miami and we can go down the list. Alabama, Georgia, uh, it, it is a rough schedule. But, um, you know, I don't know. It's hard to put a number on it because you have so many questions offensively. Uh, outside of 
your number one tight end and your number one receiver everywhere else is a position battle. And uh, that's just not happening in a lot of places in the SEC. So it's kind of that we don't really know, you know, who's going to show up, what's the quarterback situation going to be, who's going to run the ball, things like that. It could end up being a positive, it could be a negative. So a lot of unknown, a lot of position battles. Like I said, you can go nine deep when you start talking about position battles on the offensive side of the football. But with the defense they have, and I truly believe they'll be a top five defense in the country, they'll keep them in ball games. It all comes down to can the offense make enough plays to win those games. Great stuff, as always, from uh, Jacob Hester. Uh, J- Jacob, be well. We uh, always enjoy catching up with you. Hope to see you soon. Absolutely, Paul. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. Uh, great running back in LSU, talking about his experiences and what to expect this year from the LSU Tigers. Made it to the final hour, and I think uh, after a bumpy beginning, we're in good shape. We've taken a 12-point lead, and we're going to coast on our way to the finish tonight. Slow start, fast finish. And when you think of fast finishes, can you imagine starting the final hour to a program from a guy who's unranked in Kubiak and John Hayes' top ten list? I don't believe it, Jerome. Baby, man, I ain't got time for no damn top ten. You know what I am on? I was minding my own business, but see, this is the second time I've heard you mention Texas a and going to uh, get to the playoff. Hey, explain that, Paul. Well, I explain it because uh, Jimbo Fisher is, a, is one of the best coaches in the SEC, and uh, they have the best facilities in the SEC. They have one of the best fan bases in America, and usually you coalesce all of that around and you win. Remember when Alabama wasn't winning? What did they do? They brought in a yeah, big time coach. I don't remember when A&M Alabama wasn't winning. Was winning. They brought in a ball. big. I don't remember. Jerome, your program's not the only one that can win. I, I can't tell. I can't tell. That's all y'all talk about. Let Nick have been in touch. You barely won the na- Jerome. Jerome. Jer- what, Paul? You barely won the national championship against one of your so cousins. What? So what? I barely got a damn band this morning and made it to work, but I made it. <laughs> so what? What they got to you do with be- it? Took a, it took an overtime win, Jerome. You know why? No, no, Paul. It took it took little Nicky putting Tua in and just damn giving the offense over to Tua and said, "Go get the damn championship." That's what it took, Paul. And and, so what, and what happened? And what happened? What happened the year before when uh, Dabo beat you guys? But I don't know what happened but during the game. But I tell you what happened after the game. Hey, hey Jerome, let me ask you a question. Where yes. do you where do you where do you live? I live in Trustville. What they got to do with anything? What state do you live in? No, answer my question, Jerome. Answer my question. What state do you live in? You get to the point. Well, you know what state I live in. Get to the point. That's Alabama, right? Right. Who won the state championship in Alabama this year between Auburn and Alabama? Kudos, kudos. (laughs) What time they going to see Governor (laughs) Kate? Kudos. (laughs) Who cares? What they got to do with anything, Fireball? Y'all keep asking, talking. You you come up with these old foolish scenarios and all these. Crazy hell I don't know, whatever you want to call it, I'm trying to put it Alabama is still the damn king of college football, Paul. Okay, still. we get that, Jerome. So what's okay, your point? You, what, what is your it? point? What, Paul? You know what? Now you want to bring up quarterback controversy in Tuscaloosa. Well, why, why don't controversy. you tell me uh, if this is a good look for Alabama right now when the starting quarterback – uh, looks like he's not even the the second best quarterback on the team. Well, I can't help that. That ain't my fault. That What's ain't that? my fault. Little Nicky better do what he. Hey, little Nicky better do the right damn thing. <laughs> you hear me? I don't care what who don't look like nothing down there in T town. Little Nicky better come when Little Ben hit the field. He better have a tour, tour on the field. That's who better be on the field, Paul. So that quarterback controversy, that's just ready your media talk, Paul. I don't think it's media it. talk. So, uh, hey, there ain't no, we don't have no controversy in Tuscaloosa. I, I, I'm not the one who told the, the newspaper reporter last week that uh, my, when my son, if my son leaves Alabama, he'll be the greatest free agent in college football history. That's your quarterback, not mine. Uh, well, you know what, Paul? All I can tell him is I'm going to pray for him, and I hope if he decides to leave, he land in a good destination. You hear me? <laughs> That's all but, I but, you, but you have already sold out your starting quarterback, the man who oh, no, led you to two national ball. championship games. I didn't sell him out, fine ball. Yeah, you did. Tua you just got did. through selling him out. Do what? You just sold him out a minute ago. I didn't sell him out. Don't come with that foolish.
was trying to put me on blast, Paul. I didn't sell him out. You hear me? He sold himself out. If little, all I bet is, little Nicky better put the right person on the field. You mean we got too many playmakers out there? We got too many stars need the football. We ain't got time for that foolishness this year. We got to separate. You hear me? Georgia is on our butt right now, Paul. You hear me? Well, I know I'm that they, they, uh, Jerome, they they whipped you guys in recruiting. I don't give a crap about one doggone number one recruiting class. We got a whole bunch of them down there in Tuscaloosa, Paul. You hear me? Yeah, but they you, don't, you, do, but you, but, but you have to. You have to admit, Jerome. I mean, you, you you're an honest guy. I like you for that. I ain't got to admit nothing. You have to admit. Question. You have to admit that little old Kirby is starting to get in Nick Saban's head. Hey, listen. He is not only getting in the nick of head, Paul, he got in mind. You hear me? <laughs> hear me? Hey, look, when, when he started landing them athletes last year, I couldn't breathe, Paul. All I could think of was Julio and Mark Ingram class. I was like, Jesus Christ, what's going on in Georgia? You hear me? But, hey, y'all enjoy it, Paul, because guess what? They trying to load up, Paul, and we already loaded. So, so whatever they doing up there, Georgia, kudos to them, baby. Have a blast. Do what you got to do, baby. But we still the damn kings of college football, man, bro. For now. But well, hey, until further notice. And don't forget, and don't now. forget, you got Kirby. You got I don't give a, what Kirby got to do with You got Jimbo, and now you got Jeremy Pruitt in Knoxville. But, fam, I don't care what you got in the East, Norway. I don't give a crap about all that. The problem is you still got a little Nicky in T-Town. For how you long? Know? For how long? I, I, I hope he's there for 10 more years, fam, boss. But I you, know, you, you know he's not going to be there for 10 years. That's that's ridiculous. Well, you know it is ridiculous, but, you know, ain't nothing wrong. I hope and wishing and praying. Well, I, I would, I'm not going to stop you from praying. Well, I'm going to keep on praying, fam, boss. You hear me? Because, you know, and, until little Nicky leaves, like I tell you all the time, Paul, until he decides to hang up the damn cleat, roll damn time. <laughs> <laughs> An epic call by Jerome, as we expected. Matt on Paris Island. How are you, Matt? Hey, how's it going? We are doing great, Matt. Welcome to the show. Yeah, it's kind of hard to go after that. Uh, well, let's just start off by saying War Eagle. Um so, uh, so I've got a little bit of concern uh, as an Auburn fan. Uh, we got Jared Stidham, and there's a lot of hype with him. And I almost feel like going back to Jeremy Johnson, where there was all that hype surrounded with him, and he kind of puttered out. I'm well, wondering. He, but come on, I mean, the hype for for Jared Stidham is legit. We we know what he's capable of. Uh, I think the right. bigger the bigger question is what kind of, what type of cast is he going to have around him? He's not going to have Carry on Johnson anymore. He's not going to have Petway. I mean, tell me tell me uh, what he's going to have in that backfield. Right, and, and that's what I'm wondering if Gus Malzahn will get out of his play call and do a little bit more play action passing. Uh, let Jarrett do his strengths, um, and for one time adjust his offensive play calling. Um, that's what I was just getting ready to say. I think that he's got the potential to carry us, uh, but they're going to have to change the offensive scheme a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Matt, well, thank you. Really appreciate the call. Thanks for the uh, info. Let's go to J.D. in Arkansas. Hello, J.D. J.D., uh, this is P.A., but it doesn't matter. i, I got one thing I need to say. Uh, I'm going to repeat what I said the other day. I have never seen a program that pimps Texas A&M, and the University of Tennessee more than this one. Now, I get this. I understand why you pimp Tennessee. You're, a, you're an alum, and I get that. But uh, A&M, uh, Jimbo Fisher, I mean, he, believe me, he didn't come down from... Uh, so, so, J.D., let me make sure. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, 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 J.D., what, 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 J.D., let's start that, over again, know? okay? He's J.D., J.D., guy. slow down. What what is your beef with me again? You said I'm, I I did I did what for uh, you pimp, pimp Tennessee Texas A and M. You allow those calls. You talk about how great Jimbo Fisher is and how he does. He can do this. Okay, well, let, let's A&M. let's. Uh, are we Talk gonna have to a, a JD. national contender? Uh, JD, well, we've never been a national contender. Am I the only person that likes having conversations in this world? JD, may we talk to each other instead of talking at each other? Okay, you're right. You're right. I, I, I'll. Uh, Okay, uh, you're, you're obviously an you're obviously an Arkansas fan, correct? 
Correct. Okay. I, mean, I admit that we're on the wrong end of the pig. I okay, so that. let's not let's let's leave Tennessee out of it. They have nothing to do with this fight. Let's talk about A and M and Arkansas. You ready? And how they've beaten us the last five years. Okay. Now between the coaches, I, I go along with that. between the so coaches, we beat them the first three years that we played down there. So I mean, it was three, basically three and five. Okay. Let's, and then we've gone through two coaches. One that never should have been here in the first place. Okay. One that should have never been fired. We still had Bobby Petrino. We would have never lost. So you're A&M. saying you're saying Petrino shouldn't have been fired after. Uh, he, no, used... he should not have been fired. Okay. That two weeks after that. Are you serious? Are ball, you serious? I guarantee you everybody would have forgotten about it. It would have been a non-story. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just... Uh, J.D., it was, uh, J.D., I'm going to ask you again. Uh, J.D. J.D. I thought he was holier than thou and uh, was going to make a, a splash on the... J.D., I, I'm going to ask you again. Can we talk or do you, do you have to... I mean, is there... A, when you... Is there is there a stop button on your voice activator? No. no okay. I want to I want to talk about, about Bobby Petrino for a second. Bobby okay, Petrino, uh, can you can you give me just a second? I know it's yeah. your show, but give me a second. Um, Bobby Petrino had a relationship with a subordinate who clearly got her job because of him. It came out. Not only did he lie to his immediate supervisors, he lied to everyone around him. And you and you're saying you're saying with a straight face that it was political correctness that he and he shouldn't have been fired and people would have forgotten about it in two weeks. Are you are you serious? I am serious as pancreatic cancer. That's pretty serious. Yeah, that's very serious. Well, I want you uh, I want you to explain uh, why you thought uh Lying to your superiors after breaking every imaginable school policy, who knows who knows what about state law? I don't even know, but it seems like he came pretty close. Um, well, okay, can I say something about that? You can say um, anything you want. Okay, uh, that been, uh, firing Petrino, that's what people in Arkansas were saying. We got a firing because uh, there's legal, there's lawsuits that can be brought forth. Well, firing Petrillo still doesn't mitigate what he did. J.D., J.D., uh, do, you, did. do you think lying to a superior is a fireable offense? Yes, but I think every every situation uh, should uh, should be uh, uh, looked at upon its own he, merit. Listen, I, I, I what, know a lot about oh, this case because I know Bobby Petrino. And I've, I've sat down, I and, I, and, and yeah, I sat I down with I sat down with Bobby Petrino after that happened while he was not coaching. Uh, not long after he got fired, a couple of months later. and So I don't claim to know everything, but I know a little bit. And, and I'm just really puzzled by you thinking that the University of Arkansas would sell its soul to keep this man in that position. But, but I, I know we're getting off the subject here. That, that man is an offensive genius. He is. I agree. And He's and also you a, do not come by those kind of coaches very often as proof positive of uh, the guy we thought that we were getting. Well, I got to tell you something, uh, JD. I, I don't know. I don't know how you were brought up, but 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 I was brought up that if you're a liar, if you're a philander, if you're misrepresenting your bosses and your in, and your and your and your, and your employer, you ought to get fired. Uh, you ought to get your you ought to get thrown out of there as fast as possible. And it, I mean, I just cannot imagine your thought process on this story. I really can't. Oh. Well, there's a lot more. Pe- I mean, I'm not the only one. I promise you that. Well, I'm, I'm not, sure you're not. Uh, there's plenty of there's plenty of people out there that uh, that probably found nothing wrong with it. But I, I found a lot wrong with it. And uh, well, I, I, I mean, now, Paul, let me say, I don't I don't think it's right what he did. Well, don't get me. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I don't. Think if you it's, if it's you really think your if you think your football program is bigger than that university, uh, if you think that football program is bigger than 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 integrity and morality and, and doing the right thing, then that's fine. That's the football. And you're. And by the way, you're right. Uh, your your program on that level has been a laughing stock ever since. But, a laughing stock. Uh, yeah, I would say it's better. the guy you, you well, brought in there maybe next. That's one. why we didn't need the firing. Oh well. So maybe maybe maybe, maybe instead maybe you, you should have maybe you should have hired someone other than Brett Bielema. You ever thought about that? I agree with that. I, I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree a hundred percent more. Okay. Well, let's, let's move on because I really don't think the uh, Bobby Petrino situation, which what happened in uh, 2000 and whatever, 
11, 10, I don't even remember when it was. I don't think that needs to be relitigated. I think Jeff Long and the University of Arkansas did the right thing. I'm, I'm shocked that you don't think so. But then again, you're footing football program ahead of other priorities, which can't believe.